Okay, well, thanks. I'd like to talk about rivers. Um, and also, what I really want to talk about is the science of what we know about rivers, but I really want to go to the details about what we're doing about it. It's one thing for scientists to restate a problem, but I want to talk about our response to that problem and how, how we actually might restore rivers to back to some sort of level of ecological health. So, if we think of that bucket, that is all the world's water. So that is water in ice, in the atmosphere, in the oceans, that bucket. But what is, that's what's fit to drink out of that bucket. So all of our domestic use, all of our use for industry and agriculture, all the protection of freshwater biodiversity is reliant on that one single drop out of, the, out of that bucket. So that's what human existence is reliant upon. And to do that, obviously the world acts like a giant water process with water in the, in, in the clouds and then the, the, uh, rains and evaporates down. So, but typically that's the size of the water which we rely on. But are we looking after it? Well, clearly no. So we look at the um, populations of the world which don't have access to clean drinking water. Lots of parts of sub-Saharan Africa, um, parts of Southeast Asia, um, we think about over a billion people currently lack access to safe drinking water. About 2 billion people don't have access to suitable sanitation. In Africa, women and children... Talk to the microphone, sorry. It's rather than the PowerPoint. Sure. Otherwise, it would be a silent movie. A silent movie, okay. We know in Africa, women and children spend an awful lot of time carting water because in Africa, you know, men, men talk and women work. Uh, and we think preventable water, waterborne diseases such as river blindness, schistosomiasis, kill about 6,000 children a day during some of the peak, um, peak, peak wet seasons in Africa. So it's a pretty dire sort of numbers we're looking at in terms of that one single drop and what we're doing to that one single drop. So we believe there's large scale global water quality issues. You know, salt affects about a fifth of our, of our agricultural landscapes. Uh, waters that come contaminated with arsenic, especially in Bangladesh and India. We have nitrite, nitrite contamination of groundwaters. We have freshwater fish advisories saying don't consume in lots of states of the US. And obviously following floods, not obviously, but following floods, we often have large outbreaks of, of cholera. So that one drop, again, we're not looking after it the way we should. So it's not just water quality, it's water quantity as well. We believe the human footprint this is an example. This is the Glasshouse Mountains in southeast Queensland. The human footprint through river regulation, which is putting dams and pumps in place, uh, climate change, urbanisation, the way that groundwater and surface will interact are all changing the amount of the volume of water in rivers. So not only are we changing the water quality through pollution, we're actually changing water quantity as well. So are these threats going away? Well, clearly no. Uh, end of last year, we had... Um, 7.9 billion people. Um, there's a trend for increased urbanisation, which is a trend for increased water use. Uh, we currently use about half the world's renewable water resources. This is one of my sites in Burkina Faso in Western Africa. That's on the upper Volta River. I wouldn't go there as a holiday destination. So it's a bit grim. But ecologically, rivers really are the ecological arteries of the landscape. They're the most important parts of any catchment. This is one of the river systems I've been working on for 30 years. This is up in the Pilbara. This is the Robe River, just south of the Fortescue. And what I like this slide is that it shows the only part you can see any biological activity, anything growing, is actually associated with the river. So all the plants are associated with the river. All the animals, the fish and the things that eat the fish are ultimately reliant on that ecological artery. So very important parts of, of landscapes. So ecological arteries, they're sites of high biodiversity and often they're the only sites of biodiversity, especially in arid landscapes. They're wildlife corridors, you can see here, this is in far North Queensland, but also these things here, which we're reliant on, uh, they provide us with fresh water. They provide us with some food, some medicines, they have the ability to assimilate waste, and obviously they have nice aesthetic values, such as that, that river there. That's the Turner River in, in far north Queensland. So things are of biological importance and things are important for us. So what I'm going to talk about then is 
knowing what we know about these large scale impacts we're putting on rivers, both to the quantity and quality of water. I want to talk about that at a large scale, but what we're actually doing, how can we intervene? You know, we can't intervene on a global scale, we'd like to, but how are we actually intervening in the catchment scale to try to improve things? Uh, here's some examples. That's the Mekong River on the right, where there's been a lot of logging, a lot of when they pull the, the timber out of the, out of the side of the river, all the sediment goes and fills the pools in and a lot of the fish die. And on the left is the site I'll talk a little bit about, which is Cooper Creek in um, central Queensland. So it's about how we translate our research into on-ground works is really the point I want to make with this. And we produced a series of papers in Nature about global rivers being in crisis. Um, but what we essentially did for these papers is we broke the world up into one kilometre by one kilometre squares. And each of those squares, we collected as much data as we could about how much water was in that square, how many weeds, how many introduced fish, what was the GDP. We didn't have numbers. We worked out how many mobile phones were actually sold in that square. We looked at pollution. We didn't have numbers for pollution. We worked out how much fertiliser was sold. But essentially, we had took a couple of years. We had data for every kilometre by kilometre square of, of the earth on things we thought were important in terms of how rivers actually function. So what we did is in these kilometre by kilometre squares, we looked at on the far left there, incident human water security threat. So HWS is human water security. And what that essentially means is that without dams in place, without water storages, how much threat would people have in terms of, of lack of water? And it's pretty high. You know, in, in southwestern WA where we are, it rains for three months a year, we have to get nine months of water. So without having storages or ways to, to keep water, we would, we would have some measure of water stress. The slide underneath that, the other is investment factor. Obviously, we, we don't go through water stress. We've invest, invested in dams and pumps and desal plants. So we've invested heavily to make sure the human water security is fine. People in, the, people in, in Western Australia don't suffer from lack of water. So the adjusted human water security, which is the top right, it, that takes into account the, the natural way the water uh, comes to us through rainfall in winter, in our, in our case, and how much we've invested to make sure that water is stored and available to us to use. But the bottom right looks at biodiversity threat. Even though we've made large investments in making sure human water security is fine, you know, we don't suffer, we haven't made similar investments in terms of protection of freshwater biodiversity. So you can see, you know, large parts of the Murray-Darling Basin now have high levels of threat for, for, for um, freshwater biodiversity. We know the Murray-Darling is almost 200% allocated, um, which consequently leads to a lack of water, lack of connection, and the threats we see to the current biodiversity. So if we scale that up and look at a, a, a global um, scale, if we look at the adjusted human water security, this is just how water is delivered naturally and how much we've invested in water infrastructure to make sure that we don't go through a lack of water. So what you can see is the Western world, we don't, we don't suffer from a lack of water. But large parts of the world do because we just haven't made a similar investment. So parts of Sub-Saharan Africa, parts of India and Southeast Asia still undergo measures of human water security threat because those investments just haven't been made. But if we, if we look at biodiversity threat then, even though I said we've made large investments in the Western world to make sure the human water security is fine, is, the threat is low, we haven't made similar investments in the protection of biodiversity. So the US, um, large parts of Europe, it's a large threat to biodiversity because just the way we collect water uh, and store it. So what I want to talk about then is we know that globally rivers are in a parlous state. We haven't protected them well. We've, we've made sure human water security when we can has been adequately catered for, but biodiversity is really under threat. So what I'm going to talk a lot about now is some of the restoration work we're doing at a catchment scale to try to improve biodiversity values at a scale we can actually operate at. So I'll talk a lot about riparian vegetation. The riparian just means trees and plants which grow on the side of a river. Um, so I'll talk a lot about that. I'll talk a bit about environmental flows and some of the public policy around environmental flows and how they've evolved 
and a little bit about water quality, but mostly around, I'll talk about repairing restoration and the provision of environmental flows. So this is about protecting rivers using um, repairing vegetation at a catchment scale. Why I like this slide, it shows what repairing vegetation, the streamside vegetation can actually do to a river. It shades it out and keeps it cool. And we know, and I'll show you in a minute why that we think that's important for the protection of biodiversity. And if you go fishing, there's the places you go fishing where there's a bit of shade or where there's some timber in the water. So repairing vegetation is really important in terms of how it controls water temperature. And I'll show you a bit of data. I'm not sure it's too late in the day to see some data, but I'm gonna show it to you anyway. Um, these are sites in southeast Queensland and the plot along the bottom, that plot is water temperatures logged every couple of minutes over 24 hours for, what was it, a week. So the black line shows, sorry, the blue line shows the present situation, which was a, a little bit of vegetation in place, not a lot. The temperature would get up to about 27 during the day, drop down to about 20 at night. But with our model, we could actually take that vegetation away, and that's the black line. So you remove all the vegetation, the temperature got up to 30 degrees, down to 20, something at night, huge fluctuations in temperature. But then with our model, which is the red line, we could show what would happen if we actually put vegetation back in place. The temperature is very low, comparatively, it's around 20 degrees, but also the day and nighttime amplitude is pretty small, because the amplitude that really starts impacting on the biodiversity. So we knew we were onto something here in terms of using vegetation just to shade out streams and keep them cool. Sorry. Sorry. So we thought we'd develop a, a bioregional model about how we actually might do this. Where would we actually plant vegetation? What temperatures would we be aiming for to protect biodiversity? And we ran that model across. We had a national program, all these different places in Australia where we actually had good Good met, you know, good met data essentially. So we had sites from the Cool Temperate down in Tassie, subtropics in, in just north of Brisbane, uh, up in the Kimberley. This is the Prince Regent River. If anybody's a budding freshwater ecologist, sample that river because we don't know what's in it. It takes a helicopter to get in there, but we really like to know what actually lives in that river. So a good field trip. Project. Project, yeah, yeah. I suppose the point I want to make here, if it refreshes, is our latitude's important. You know, we had a range of sites from the Kimberley, the tropics right down to the temperate. I'm sorry, it has moved twice. Oh, okay, okay. What we've done here, and this is gonna take a little bit of explaining, um, we had this fisheye camera, which took a 180 degree photo upwards. So we put this in the river and take a photo above us essentially. So what those plots show, am I gonna get out of the screen here by? The black is actually the shade from vegetation. The, the, the yellow is how the sun tracks down the channel. We had a program which had how the sun was actually tracking different times of the, of the year. And the point I want to make is that in the tropics, the sun tracks down the channel quite a lot. So it puts a lot of light and heat into the rivers. As we move further south, the sun tracks more to the north. So the north bank becomes more important the further south we go. It's just, you know, almost straight geometry really. But what that means is that the further we move away from the tropics, the more important it became to revegetate and protect that north bank to cool down rivers uh, than in the, in the tropics. And this just shows when we exceeded those threshold levels and started growing nuisance algae and the water heated up far too much. So latitude's important. And also orientation's important. Again, this is a shot of a creek. The, that bit there's the river. The black bit's the shade. The yellow is how the sun tracks. So in a north-south running creek, the sun's only on the top of the channel for certain times of the day. It wasn't putting a lot of light and heat. But in, in an east-west running creek, the sun's tracked down the channel a lot. So it put a lot more light and heat into the rivers. So latitude is important, but also orientation, because if we're running east-west, it's going to take more effort and more shade to cool those rivers down compared to a north-south orientated creek. 
You with me? Is it good? So the critical thing is we, we know we can use vegetation to control shade, but what temperature we're aiming for. So what we've done here is what's called lethal dose testing. So we put bugs and fish uh, in containers, heated them up and found out when half of them died. So if God's a bug, I'm in a bit of trouble here because I sent a lot to the, um, to the afterlife. But essentially what we found is around 21, 22 degrees is when a lot of our, our bugs, which are the basis of the food chain in the rivers, and a lot of the fish started dying off. So that became our target. We're actually quite surprised how low that temperature was. You know, Australia's not a cool place. But when you think about where Australia and fauna actually evolved in Gondwana land, it was a lot further south where our fauna evolved. So it was used to being cool. With continental drift, the continents moved north and got warmer and warmer, but we still have this ancient Gondwanic fauna. The point I wanted to make is that we knew that we could plant vegetation in certain places to control temperature, and now we actually had a measure of what temperature we're aiming for. Um, so then what we did, which will be the next slide, is work out for all those different regions in Australia, what temperature the local fauna could handle before they all started flooding the surface and dying. So these became our threshold targets. This is what we knew from all our lethal dose testing is when we started losing fish and bugs, which are the base, I said, the basis of the food chain. Around Perth, we think it's around 22 degrees is our target value. Uh, in the north, around 29, the tropical species is a bit more resilient. And further south around Hobart, a bit more, of course, sensitive. So then we have to use our model to work out, well, how much shade does that take to keep a river below those those threshold values. So around Perth, it takes about 70% shade to keep the water temperature below 22.5, which enable the fauna to survive. Um, in the tropics, a bit more. In Tasmania, because it's already cold, a couple of sticks will probably do the job. <laughs> but that became our, our target threshold then for replanting. So we knew we could control temperature by, by repairing shade, we knew what our target was. Then the question is, where do we put it in the landscape? We never ever have the ability to get a whole catchment. Um, research programs just aren't that big and that um, of that scale. So where in the catchment do we replant to keep the water temperature down below those threshold levels? How do we optimize the investment we have in, in restoration? So we came up with a number of ways to look at this. Um, this is an example, this is actually a Tasmanian example. On the left here, this is just a vegetation map from the aerial photo. And we just mapped the vegetation as it was into three categories. Um, the darker, the more shade it had. Then we used uh, another model, which worked out how much light actually hit each of those parts of the river, um, just based on its orientation, because I showed before the orientation was important. So we had these two things. We had how much vegetation is in place and how much solar radiation would hit that stream based on its orientation. And from that, we came up with a priority map. So, and this is quite, quite interesting. It's actually all, almost the opposite of what we've done in restoration in Australia. If this is, this is, a, this is a, you know, a catchment system. Usually we have a town down the bottom on a larger river we plant a few trees around the town, it makes very little difference because the river's really vulnerable to what's happening upstream. Once the water's warm, it's really hard to cool it down. So our priority then became east-west running creeks because we knew if we could keep those cooler, we could have a bigger impact. And the top part of catchment rather than the bottom, once you cool water down, it stays cool for a lot longer than, um, than the other way around. So obviously east-west, the north part of the catchment, cool the water down and then it flows down to the other parts through the network. So that became our priority because we're asking farmers to give up some productive land um, and the scale of our restoration is never large enough, as I said, to get a whole catchment. So we came with, with a number of principles. Upland rivers before lowland streams, upland streams before lowland rivers because they have the bigger impact. Um, restore reaches that have very little vegetation. Uh, Rivers on an east-west aspect, the north bank became important the further south you went, um, as, we, as we saw in that last dot point. So that became the general principles which have been used around Australia now in terms of how we optimise our investment 
in restoration. That's all fine, but that's for a static temperature uh, value. We know through climate change and through drying, we're seeing increased warming and increased drying. So the targets we've set are a moving baseline, essentially. If you have a look at some of the data, and you've probably seen this, the top left is inflow to our reservoirs. We've had about a 40% reduction in inflow to our dams over the last, from the 1960s onwards. And that's a continual trend of, of decreased flows. At the same time, we've seen increased temperatures as well. So you look at some of the data, since about the 60s, we've seen about a 0.8 degree rise in, in surface temperatures in the Southwest against the 1960s baseline. So what do we do? We, that's not set up actually, that was, <laughs> that was how it was. <laughs> so we, for the, Sure, okay. Sorry, Sorry I'd like to move. I'm just going to... <laughs> we have to cater for a 40% reduction in rainfall by, by 2050 and probably a two degree rise in temperature given some of the IPCC predictions and some of the models that we're using about minimum inter intervention. So a two degree rise is going to push all our restoration targets into different areas now. So what, what are we going to do? What we do know is that temperatures change naturally um, as you go up a mountain, for every, every kilometre you go vertically, the temperature goes down 6.5 degrees. And for every 150 kilometres away from the equator, the temperature reduces by one degree. That's just you know, um, lapse rates, they're called. Mm -hmm. So we knew we could... Jeez, my, my, my director here is getting on my case. <laughs> sure, sure, okay. So what this, we've seen a lot of this in terms of the change of distribution of plants up mountains. As it gets warmer, the distribution moves up because of those lapse rates. So they're quite large, a 6.5 degrees change for every kilometre vertical. And, you know, one degree for every 145 k's away from the equator, either north or south. So a two degree rise in temperature then, it means the ideal boundaries then for the national parks have to be probably 150 kilometres off the south of the south coast of WA, which is pretty hard to move. And also what we know is these are our global biodiversity hotspots as defined by United, United Nations. And most of those are what we call geographically constrained, which means they're against, usually against the edge of a continent. In our case, in southwest WA, we can't go further south to cool it down because we've got nowhere to go. We don't have mountains. We've got the Darling Scar, which is you know, 3,000 million years old, been eroded, there's no height left. So we actually have to restore in situ because we can't allow plants and animals to move because there's nowhere to go. And which has served us well in COVID. We're surrounded by ocean and desert and into the world. So we thought we need to build what we're calling a biophysical envelope. We have to allow for the fact that plants and animals can't move. So we have to do it in situ. So how do we do this? We go back to our temperature model then. If we're looking at a 2050 baseline of two degree rise, these become our, our, temper, our restoration targets. You know, around Perth, to get around 70 and Sydney or so, 90% shade in place to keep it below that increased two degree temperature below those threshold values. So we're probably pushing up against the limits of what's possible in terms of restoration. That's one thing, but if we put a lot of vegetation in place on the bank of a river, does that actually change the ecology? Is that going to change how rivers function? So a fair amount of our work then was looking at, well, how important is this streamside vegetation anyway? If we fill a bank, bank up with trees and they grow up, what happens to the river? It's cool, but what else might, it might happen? This is some of our work using natural stable isotopes. And how this works is that if you eat something, you take on the same carbon signature as the thing you've eaten. So we can track carbon through a food web. And in a river, there's only two ways it can get carbon. It can drop in from the outside as leaves, or it can grow its own as algae or um, sedges and, and reeds. So only two sources, import from outside or grow your own. And by using our isotope technique, we can figure out how much of that carbon was actually distributed through the food webs, what was eating it. And when we do those numbers, <coughs> here are those plots. 
the invertebrates and the fish which eat those, because that signature chain doesn't change from consumer, uh, all overlies that riparian value. So most of the carbon, which was plants and the plants, sorry, the animals reliant on, came from outside the river. It came from leaves dropping in from the riparian zone. So in terms of not changing how a river works, it seemed fine to us the fact that rivers were reliant on riparian carbon dropping in, and that fueled these food webs. If we have a look at some of the things we're talking about, these are some of our ancient bugs. So these are the things that the, you know, the, the fish eat, the waterfowl eat. Little guys like these, which make surfboards so they can stay in the water column and not get swept downstream. Um, things that got external gills. These things are ancient. These things are Gondwanic. So they're 120 plus million years old. So they've been around for a while. And obviously these things are distributed through food webs, through, you know, piggy perch, uh, jilgies and marin and those type of things. But ultimately, if you look at the carbon, it all comes from outside the river, dropping in as leaves, and that fuels these whole food webs. These things are labelled up the same. So we know that that's how these systems are put together. So we think about 80 or 90% of the carbon in the bugs and the fish and the things that eat those ultimately comes from leaves and sticks and stuff dropping in from the repairing zone and fueling these food webs. So in terms of restoration, we're not going to alter the way the rivers work. Um, we're putting vegetation in place, cooling the water and also providing that bottom of the food chain. Also, what we know about vegetation, when branches and trees drop in, it's important habitat. There's a lot of work done in our rivers in the 1920s to call it desnagging, to take the vegetation out because they thought it caused flooding. So that's what a lot of our rivers look like now. And what they look like historically was a lot of timber. And again, if you go fishing, you know, that's where fish are. They're around the, the logs and the stumps and those type of things. So putting, repairing vegetation in place, allowing it to die and branches fall off and land on the river is also important habitat. Now here's a good example of that. This is the, um, this is the Harvey River. So it's been reduced, all the timber's been taken out. There's very few fish or crayfish and those type of things in that river. So a lot of projects we're doing now is putting, putting vegetation, putting wood back in place, allowing the river to um, reestablish. What I like about this is the river's actually still trying to meander, still trying to be a river. Even though it's been channelized, it's been converted to a drain, it still wants to be a river. I want to talk a little bit then, That's, these are sort of your typical temperate uh, rivers. We'll talk about some of our larger rivers. These are our internal flowing large floodplain rivers. This is the Diamantina and Cooper Creek flowing into Lake Eyre. That's an example during flood. They're fantastic systems. We, we don't know a lot about them. Uh, this is close to the dig tree. You know, Burke and Wills had a good look and partly came back. There you go. Okay, right. What's interesting about the river here is you might see it as it's what we call very turbid. It has a sort of the same constituency, I suppose, as coffee. So it's very muddy. And we thought um, that could be caused by cattle. There's a lot of cattle in these landscapes, but apparently that's what they're like historically. Burke and Wills talked about how muddy these rivers were naturally. So what we thought then is that because so little light can get into those rivers, then algal production can't be important because there's nothing to drive algae, nothing to make it grow because it's so, so, so muddy. So that's that same river there, that bit. We managed to sample during a flood. So from being you know, 20 meters wide, it was about 30 or 40 kilometers wide during a flood. We're just lucky to get a sort of one in 50 year flood when we're out there. So when you see these floods, they sort of leave these sort of old ancient dunes behind. They become full of animals because everything's looking for refuge during these floods. And we, we measured what we did during the dry is put these things in place, which just measures how much carbon is being burnt up, how much is being produced and how much is being burnt up. And we did that, you can't see it with that right across the, the channel. So these things are data loggers and record every couple of minutes. And they tell us a lot about what carbon's doing. And what we found is, again, exactly opposite to what we thought. We thought these rivers are very turbid. There's no light getting in, so algal production can't be important because algae needs light to grow. 
what we found was is we call this bathtub ring on the very outside of these pools is a really highly productive area which grew a lot of algae producing about three grams per metre per year, which is per day, which is almost hydroponic in its, in its, in its, in its rates. So that little bathtub ring was really pumping along. And again, with our isotope techniques, we found that little bathtub ring, again, was driving the whole food web. So shrimps, uh, snails were eating that, and then they were being eaten by yellow belly and yabbies and those type of things. But ultimately, it was the opposite to what we found in the temperate areas. Repairing carbon wasn't very important. It was just that little bathtub ring around the outside of these pools, which drove these food webs. And that made them very vulnerable then to cattle coming down and trampling it. Or when they plant cotton there, they pump the pools down and they pump them down so fast, the algae can't track the water down. So it becomes desiccated and dies. So that little bathtub ring becomes very vulnerable. So I so said, we managed to sample during a flood, which was you know, pretty lucky, which wasn't the plan. We just happened to be out there. So what you can't see is that trees, everything that's vertical has spiders and scorpions. So in the end, we had to put plastic bags around our legs and tape them up because if something would see you as high ground and shoot up your legs. So some, got some nasty surprises. So plastic around the legs to keep the bugs out. So we had a sample in the floodplain. As you can see, it's a very well funded uh, research program. We've got the experimental boat out there. And uh, we did the same thing. We put these, they're called metabolism chambers. They just measure how much carbon is being produced or consumed out on the floodplain. And what we found was out on the floodplain, one day of production, just one day, is the same as what these catchments produce in 82 years during the dry. So when the river gets, when the flood gets out in the floodplain, it switches on these huge rates of production, which enable these systems to, to sort of be resilient and carry on between, between these large flow events. So, you know, rivers get obviously bad press for all the damage they do, but ecologically, they're a really important part of how these systems work. So what we're talking about large systems, so I'll talk a bit about the tropics, I'll finish with this. You know, most of our waters in, in the north most of it's unregulated, which means there's no dams. There's only one major dam, which is Argyle on the Yord. Actually, it's so large, it changed the rotation of the earth when they first put it in place. So when people see that water, they think, butte, we can have that. So there's plans for you know, the Kimberley Canal, because there's always the idea that water, when it goes out to sea in the tropics, is going to waste. So Barnett went to an election with this canal, and we see when we did the analysis, the water from, from the north costs about $10 a kilolitre delivered to Perth. An iceberg, it costs about $7. So it's cheaper to bring an iceberg in from the Antarctic, anchor it off Fremantle and put a tap on it. Uh, healthy rivers supply water about a dollar a kilolitre. So it's about 10, 11 times the cost of what water is delivered to us now. But when you hear CY O'Connor or nation building, it's always going to be these large schemes which sort of scare us in terms of how rivers get forgotten about. So I'll talk a little bit, a lot of this then led to the discussion around what's called environmental flows. And what environmental flows essentially mean is that once you put a dam in place, what happens downstream from the dam? How much water do we have to let go from a dam to maintain these things as still functioning rivers whilst doing the things we want them to do in terms of, this is the Karanara Diversion Dam. Because we know when we put a dam in place, we change the whole way the river and the, and the landscape connect, both upstream and downstream, how the river connects to the floodplain and how the river connects to the groundwater. So a lot of this work led to a lot of discussion around water policy. And essentially one of our guiding principles was the environment has to be considered a legitimate consumer of water, which was never the case in the past. You know, water was always bought by irrigators, and the environment was just never in the game because it wasn't seen as a legitimate consumer because nobody, nobody could fund it. So all these environmental water provisions now are around considering the water environment's legitimate consumer. And if we let water go from a dam, the best thing we can do is mimic what happened historically because that's what the fish and all the bugs and the things that eat upon them are, have evolved to, to cater with. 
this is a bit of a messy slide, but all this really shows is that the point I want to make here is in our large rivers, the more connected they are, the more diversity of different types of, bite, of bugs and fish you get and the more diversity of different types of food you get. Essentially what's happening in these systems is, you know, barramundi say are bringing marine carbon up into, into a headwater river. They're dying and that marine carbon is getting used. So the more connected a river is, the more important it is in terms of how, how it protects biodiversity. So the argument about water going to waste, this shows the blue is sort of flows and the red is the three year lag just showing after large flows, three years later, you get a huge um, catch of barramundi and similar with prawns. So the water's not going to waste, it's fueling nursery habitats and then three years later, you're getting a very good catch of barramundi. So again, just trying to make the argument that water's just not going to waste. Because when we look at tropical rivers, there's three major components. We have this main channels, these little tributaries and billabongs and the, and the floodplains. So they're the major components of, of our rivers, tropical rivers. And when we do the analysis, we found that where's, where do fish say put on their biomass from? Where do they grow gonads and where do they put by? And most of it's from the floodplain. So when the water's up on the floodplain, that's when the fish move out there, they're following that, that productivity out and that's when they're really uh, producing lots of biomass and able to reproduce. So the river itself is not that important. It's the floodplain again, which is the important part. So a point we're making is these large connected systems if we put dams in place and change the way those connections happen, we're going to fundamentally change how these rivers work. Obviously, the work in the north, we're doing a little, including a lot of indigenous people because they've got some great knowledge, obviously, being there for 68,000 years gives you a little bit of knowledge. So we've done a lot of work with them about what fish we would find where and what's important around the water holes. We did sort of analysis working out, well, how much What's bush tucker actually worth to an indigenous community? So we did sort of like for like, um, you know, we compared um, say turtles with steak and long neck turtles with chicken and say, if you had to actually buy that food from the shop, what would it cost? That's huge. So the, the, the value of the bush tucker in, his, in these indigenous communities is huge and it makes a large part of how they barter and what sort of holds the community together. So. Again, water's not going to waste. It has fundamental uses for how these communities actually, what holds them together. I really like this. This is some of our work we've done with indigenous folks up in the north and they made a calendar. They recognize, I think, 12 seasons. And each of those seasons has different plants and animals. So we've, we've been able to sort of doctor our, or modify our monitoring programs for different times a year based on their knowledge of what plants and animals should be around. And that's, as I said, the basis of our, of our large, of our large um, sampling and monitoring programs. So I just want to finish by saying, you hear a lot about in the tropics, water going to sea, it's going to waste. My argument is that it has economic value where it is because we know that leads to large barramundi and prawn catches in subsequent years. It has environmental values because we know these things are large interconnected systems and that's how they function ecologically. It has really important cultural values because you know that harvest of bush tucker, indigenous folks going down to the rivers at night is a really important part of what holds those communities together. And my last slide, I'd like to finish with something a little bit pithy maybe, but um, this is the US president at the time, uh, Benjamin Pierce, wanted to buy the rivers from Chief Seattle. Now, Chief Seattle was the guy that said, when you shot the last buffalo and eaten the last fish, you realize you can't eat money. And this is his response to uh, US president saying he wants to buy the rivers. So I won't read it out, I'll just let you plow through it. But to me, it just shows how important we think rivers are. <laughs>